Hey guys, how you doing? This is uh, Mike McCormick with Advanced Criminology here in Owings Mills, Maryland. Um, today is the 28th of December. Uh, I have this on at approximately 2.45 uh, p.m. I want to start by, by actually uh, apologizing to those of you in my last video that I recorded on 26. Um, I indicated at the end of that video that um, I would be on air today, WBOL in Baltimore between 10, excuse me, between 12 and 1 p.m. However, I received a call from the station yesterday indicating that their host of that particular news hour uh, had taken ill. So subsequently I was, you know, not going to be there today. Um, I will be awaiting their phone call uh, or their emails letting me know when that will take place again. Um, the other thing I want to make mention of is that many of you who view this particular channel come from all walks of life from a lot of different states um, and many of you come from Baltimore and I would ask that you guys when you start um, submitting your comments to me that you indicate you know where are you from um, I like to give shout outs to folks who live around the country um, and also it gives me an idea of how broad reach that this channel has gotten to since its inception so yeah, just uh, you know, you do a comment. Just let me know what part of the country you're from. From Baltimore, say Baltimore, Texas, Texas, you know, Virginia, Virginia, that kind of thing. Um, that gives me an idea geographically, you know, what people are actually listening uh, to. Uh, the other thing is that I want to discuss also. Um, a couple of days ago, we also talked about uh, a particular uh, sergeant who was uh, implicated. Uh, some years ago in a case um, dealing with corruption and planting evidence. Um, in that particular video I made mention of and I discussed at uh, in 6.17 minutes into the video I discussed um, the the promotional process and I criticized the promotional process and I still do uh, with Baltimore City and um, I can tell I have a lot of uh, police officers officers uh, retired perhaps maybe active who listen to this channel because I received uh, an email from a prior detective who worked for Baltimore City and that detective indicated a couple of things and I want to share them with you uh, regarding the promotional aspects of becoming a sergeant in Baltimore City. I'm take my glasses off as usual. Okay. Uh, a person, police officer, can apply to be a supervisor, sergeant in a department after three years of being on the force. Again, I disagree with that, but that's what this, this ex-BPD uh, officer indicated. And uh, it, it's two parts. There's a uh, written exam and an oral exam. And uh, the written exam is administered uh, by the Baltimore Human Resources Department. Um, and not the police department. And the oral exam consists of three different police officers from different agencies from around the country. Okay, so that's the civil service portion. Uh, but one of the things that the uh, officer also indicated, the detective indicated, that whether, when you take that test and if you pass that exam, um, your supervisor cannot recommend you for moving uh, into that supervisory position as a sergeant, which I found very interesting because who better would have, you know, an observation of you as an employee uh, other than your direct supervisor? Um, I don't consider lieutenants and captains direct supervisors. In fact, when you're evaluated on the police department, all those evaluations are always going to come from your direct supervisor, which would be a sergeant if you're in a squad, and then that evaluation is forwarded up, up the chain of command. So I would believe, I mean, at least when I was in the Marine Corps, I certainly couldn't have got promoted to the rank of sergeant without a recommendation initially coming from the supervisor. Uh, the test was secondary. The recommendation from the supervisor was, was, was carried so much weight it, it just wasn't funny. 
Um, and, and so when I, when I looked at that and I read it, that gave me some pause because if you're going to take the supervisor out of the equation and you're just going to make this thing uh, where you take a test and you do well on the test, because some folks can take tests and do well, some don't. And you go, your name goes on a list, and when a um, position comes open, um, you automatically get it. Now, the detective did indicate in their letter that any time an officer who has taken the exam and has passed the exam is uh, currently being investigated for complaints by citizens, that that promotion to that position, that position will be held off until that particular investigation is clear. And I bring that up because the, the departmental investigation by the Justice Department uh, highlighted at least eight pages in their report that talked about uh, investigations that were getting rubber stamped by uh, district commanders, lieutenants, captains, uh, who where citizens made direct complaints to supervisors and the complaints were going unheard. In fact, one of the statistics that they pointed out was at least over 9,000 direct complaints from 2010 uh, to 2015. Check the stats on that. Yeah, well, virtually uh, only 70%, roughly 65 to 70% of those complaints um, were uh, unheard. So that was a pause for cause because depending on how long an investigation takes, and I will tell you that the Department of Justice indicated that there were so many complaints that were follow, filed with internal investigation that those complaints would last many, many months. So just imagine if you're a supervisor, if you're a person who just passed a sergeant's exam and you're sitting there with a complaint and that complaint has not been resolved in your favor, um, you would literally be waiting to actually take over the rank of sergeant for many months because according to the Justice Department, they had filed, they had saw where uh, complaints were filed and they were not being uh, addressed in you know 12 months, 15 months, some as, some as long as two years. So what was going on in the department was you had uh, supervisors who were overriding uh, certain aspects of internal investigations and, and, and being able to pass forward those individuals uh, with kind of, you know, the good, again, the good old boy network where, you know, you know a, a, a captain or major in your district and they know you up for that particular uh, promotion um, and a spot is open. Well, you know, they're going to do their best to hurry that investigation up to get you through the process. Mind you, one of the individuals that we talked about in the last video, uh, this gentleman had several complaints against him. Uh, and they were all unfounded. So, you know, that's not to say that uh, some uh, were legitimate, but we really don't know uh, because of how they were investigated. Um, we do know, and I know this because of the outside information we've gotten in reference to uh, Sergeant Willard, that he in fact uh, was an individual that had numerous complaints and the department virtually did nothing. So we know that that exists. Uh, to say that it doesn't refutes what the Justice Department's eight-page report talked about in this over 170-page uh, 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 format that they laid out indicating uh, what had happened uh, with the BPD. So, the, again, the Department of Justice wouldn't have spent all this time and all the money needed to do the investigation um, and make the final analysis that uh, BPD on page 139, BPD fails to hold officers accountable for misconduct. I didn't make it up. It's fact. Um, so I wanted to address uh, 
the uh, uh, the supervisor's complaint and the promotional section of how things go in the department. And I also wanted to address um, what the uh, ex-detective of Baltimore Police Department had written in a letter to uh, my office. And I, uh, we appreciate that. I'm going to comment on it. I may not agree uh, total with the, some of the things that are said in the letter, um, but I'm going to respond to it. And I'm going to uh, add, add that to the comments. I think I told you guys once before that when I go online here, and if it's anything that I'm saying that is not according to what um, the department follows, um, that's fine. However, if I have information to refute that, then, then I'm going to bring it forth. Um, and that Justice Department report is my support. So I don't have to prove anything. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to address is again this is my own personal opinion based upon my you know my research and um, my academic uh, my academic uh, uh, preparedness for this particular position I'm in now as director of advanced criminology um, having had uh, 10 years on the department um, having have an advanced degree master's degree in criminal justice specializing in administrative policing or police administration. Um, one of the things that I would comment on is that I don't believe that a person with three or more, three years on the department, minimum three years on the department, is qualified to be a sergeant. Um, I'm on, having looked around the nation at different, you know, departments in terms of what it takes to qualify. There are many departments out of the 18,000 that require a little bit more time on the department to become or to be to be eligible to take any examination to become a supervisor in the field. And this is why. I have several reasons here. One, you have to learn how to develop good writing skills for reports. You have to have had handled many, many calls for service and different types of crimes. Um, you would have had to test up, testify in court many times over um, and become an expert witness. Um, you need to develop a rapport with other officers in your own district and you need to develop a rapport with the community as well. So that talks about community policing skills. And um, whether or not you have any disciplinary actions, um, you know, sometimes officers can be in a force for three years and not virtually have anything against them. Um, it might take some time, you know, to develop to see what type of character develops out of that, partic that particular officer. Um, and most importantly, I think officers need to learn, and particularly in Baltimore City and state of Maryland, you have to know Article 27, Crimes and Punishments. And that is a volume, a legal volume, that outlines what every single crime or what every single punishment a person can commit in the state of Maryland and be held accountable for it. And it has every element of that particular crime. So if you're going to be enforcing the law in Baltimore City or in the state of Maryland, you need to know as an officer what it takes uh, to have a crime occur and are, the, are all the elements going to be there um, when you write your statement of charges on your probable cause because that document is a legal document that's going to be forwarded to the court for further prosecution. Um, that takes some time to learn those types of things and I just don't think three years is enough time. I will also say that your work attendance and your performance evaluations from your immediate direct supervisor. All of those things taken collectively, in my estimation, is what it takes to move on to the next level of being a supervisor, not only in the police department, but I think in any other organization that you work for, whether it's public or private. Again, that's just my personal viewpoint. Okay, let me, let me move on, and I want to thank the officer for sending that information in. And we appreciate any information that any law enforcement can send in to us to help us better understand, you know, what's going on in their departments. And, uh, you know, we have an email address. If you feel happy, you can, you can share that. Okay, so I'll move on from that, as I just said. Um, again, the day is the uh, 28th. And uh, yesterday, the 27th, I'm just trying to update you guys. But you guys are sharp on this channel because you follow a lot of, of, of criminal justice issues, so, and I appreciate that you're up to date on a lot of stuff. 
and you educate me as well. Um, the Police Commissioner of Baltimore City just recently uh, received a letter from um, the FBI indicating that they uh, were no longer interested in um, pursuing to handle or to take lead on the investigation here in Baltimore City regarding the death of Detective Sh Sean Souter. So um, the department is back to square one. Um, and square one means that they're going to have to go back out to the crime scene, talk to more witnesses again, um, develop some, some good leads this, this time around, and uh, move forward with, with the investigation. Um, one thing I disagreed with when the commissioner came on TV, and um, I, have his, I have the statement here online. Um, the, in the letter to Commissioner Davis, he, he's quoted as saying that the letter indicated no information has been developed to indicate Detective Suda's death was directly connected to an FBI investigation. So for this reason, we believe it's prudent for your office to continue as the lead in this investigation. Okay. Um, one of the things, now from that statement that the commissioner quoted, um, he also would follow that up right after, immediately after he said, he says, the FBI, if they thought there was an association between Detective Suda's murder and an ongoing corruption case, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that they would have taken this case, Davis said. Well, a lot of things can be uh, uh, gleaned from this statement. Um, we have over 5,000 cases a year in the United States of murders that go unsolved. That's 5,000 that go unsolved. So it doesn't really matter the fact that they sent the letter saying that they have no information, and I'll tell you why. They may not have had any information during the time that they were doing their investigation. Meaning that whatever they did, it didn't pan out during this three or four week period that we had been waiting. It's not to say that more information wouldn't develop down the line. Okay, so I wanted to kind of make that clear because what the commissioner is doing is he's playing a little word game here uh, because he also says that he believes the FBI's rejecting of taking the lead in the case takes the theory off the table. I don't think it takes the theory off the table uh, because this is an ongoing investigation. It's never stopped, according to him. It's an ongoing investigation. So, um, in his mind, he's thinking that the FBI, because they said, we don't see a connection here, that okay, well then you've absolved anything internally that might have been going on with some corrupt police officers in my department. I don't think so. And I don't think so because you have to, again, this is a murder investigation. So every aspect of that investigation is important. Wherever the material the leads take you, whether it's internally, as I said before, or whether it's external with the public. Okay? And that's that and that's how it's it's supposed to be handled. I think that the way the statement comes across is kind of a statement to say, hey, look, the citizens of Baltimore, um, you guys have been wrong all along. Now the FBI has come up and said, hey, um, we don't see a connection. So therefore, um, you know, you've absolved the Baltimore City Police Department's officers if, in fact, they might have been involved in some type of uh, plot to kill Detective Souter. Um, so I don't like the way that kind of plays out. Uh, the other thing is this is that even though the FBI did not take the lead or does not want to take the lead, it does not mean that the police commissioner cannot ask the FBI for uh, help in other matters such as you know crime, crime scene detection. They have all the latest stuff. You know, so why not utilize uh, some of their materials um, to solve this case? So that was the point I wanted to bring up in his uh, news, his press release. He also indicated that uh, um, the investigation so far has indicated that uh, there is no possibility that uh, Detective Suda took his life. And I said that from the onset, that I did not believe that that detective took his life. Um, and so they'll have to go back to, out to the scene. I certainly believe, and I've, I've always said in other videos prior to this one, 
that I just didn't think that that particular crime scene got the best going over that it could have gotten. Um, and I think because the police department was under pressure to kind of hurry up and do that investigation, that, that crime scene investigation, they may have missed several uh, uh, important pieces of uh, evidence that, that was there. And so that's been my contention all along, having been down to the site a couple of times. Um, so he goes on to say that um, they may consider bringing in outside help on this investigation. I certainly would, because right now um, there's a, you know, it, it's interesting on this channel and interesting the comments I get. And not only the people who I don't have on this channel talking to me, I talk to a lot of people outside of this channel every day. And the, the question of credibility of the department has been under assault for the past few years. And so you almost have to bring additional resources from outside of the department um, to regain some credibility. And whether that's Detective Suter's case you end up solving or not, or, or many other cases that you have to handle in the course of a year in this particular city that would certainly bolster the police department's credibility in the long run. Um, so, so if you're going to bring somebody in, certainly, you know, bring, bring people in. And I don't think that that decision should be made alone by the police commissioner. I think that's a collective decision that should be made uh, with the mayor's office, as uh, the police commissioner's office. And, you know, it'd be nice if you would include some citizens every now and then when you make decisions about how things are being done in the city. Um, because they pay taxes and uh, they certainly want a voice in uh, what's going on. I'm going to leave that where it is. Um, I'm going to follow up with this video, with another video, uh, and I talked about it a few days ago where we discussed um, whether or not De Detective Suter and his family should have been treated as federal witnesses. Um, and so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that for now. Um, but we'll come back to that because that's important. I just felt it, the need to come back on today um, since I didn't do the uh, talk show this morning. And I certainly felt guilty about it because be because of the way the channel is set up, we really can't communicate with one another. And I can't really get it out there to you guys as fast as I wanted to. So, um, again, I apologize uh, for not being on that show. I can't wait to get on there. I have a lot to say. You guys know I have a lot to say. Um, and um, so... We'll um, be discussing again uh, in the next few days uh, some of the other th uh, things I want to talk about. So I appreciate your time. And as always, share our videos with everyone you know. Uh, make sure you subscribe. We're always trying to get our subscribers up. Um, we're, we're right around 350, six, somewhere around there. I certainly want to get up past 1,000 subscribers. Um, I don't know when that's going to take place, but um, just click the red button to subscribe, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, once again, share your comments, particularly uh, on how you feel about what's going to happen now in this city with um, the FBI back and away from the investigation and um, with Baltimore taking the lead on it. And um, I just want to see your thoughts and, and we'll go from there. And I also want to hear from uh, some law enforcement. You know, I want to hear from some attorneys. Let's, let's, let's see what you guys have to say. Okay, this is uh, Mike McCormick. We'll talk to you soon.